Merci, merci beaucoup tout le monde de vous joindre à nous pour cet événement aujourd'hui. C'est organisé en conjonction avec le Social Justice Center de Concordia et la Concordia Food Coalition. Euh, moi, je m'appelle Christiane Bellé, je suis coordonnatrice du Centre de justice sociale et euh, Bengui est la co-directrice du Centre de justice sociale. Donc aujourd'hui, l'événement va, euh, va avoir lieu en anglais, mais je n'ai vraiment vous pas pour poser des questions en français. J'ai oublié qu'Éric parle très bien français aussi. Euh, donc on va entendre aujourd'hui euh, Éric Chevrier il va nous présenter les conclusions de sa thèse sur euh, les façons de bâtir des campus souverains d'un point de vue alimentaire. C'est même que j'ai décidé de traduire ça. <rire> Et euh, donc, Eric, pour ceux, qui le connaissent, ceux et celles qui ne le connaissent pas, c'est un chercheur, professeur, activiste communautaire qui possède des connaissances approfondies et une grande expérience sur la souveraineté alimentaire, l'économie écologique et les entreprises sociales. Donc, il possède une expertise dans la culture, la transformation, le compostage des, des aliments ainsi que dans le développement d'économies alimentaires communautaires. Euh, il a créé plusieurs projets à Concordia, dont la Coop Cultivation et la Concordia Food Coalition. C'est de ça qu'il va vous parler en partie aujourd'hui. Et euh, je vais laisser la parole à Bengi pour une petite présentation en anglais. Hi everyone, oh, welcome to our event. We're very, very happy to host Eric and, and, uh, and any event on building food sovereignty on campuses, which has been not a topic that uh, we've been touching upon lately, so very much welcome. Uh, my name is Ben Yakut, I'm a professor at the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment, and I'm co-directing the Social Justice Center with uh, Pablo Gilabert from Philosophy, uh, from the Department of Philosophy. Social Justice Center uh, is a center at Concordia University whose mandate is to facilitate interdisciplinary research on social justice issues, as well as opening space for knowledge produced by social justice struggles. So it's not only kind of an academic uh, perspective on social justice that we're trying to uplift and, and facilitate. Um, in addition to holding events like this, uh, keep an eye out for the, for our events. They're pretty cool, as you can, you can see. Um, uh, you can find more information about it on our website, and we have social media as well. In addition to events like this, we give uh, graduate and postdoctoral bursaries and, and support uh, graduate and postdoctoral work on social justice issues. Uh, here we will be uh, today. We will be hearing from Eric Chevrier. Eric is a researcher, professor, and community activist, if I might add, and a friend. Uh, with extensive knowledge about food sovereignty, food systems, ecological economics, and social enterprises. He has expertise in growing, transforming, and composting food, as well as developing community food economies. As a scholar, he practices critical participatory action research and has co-created a variety of food-related projects, such as Cult of Action, Solidarity Cooperative, and Concordia Food Coalition, a group that brings together students, faculty, and staff to promote and facilitate a transition to a more sustainable campus food system. Um, but before I give the floor to Eric, uh, Sheila from Concordia Food Coalition joins us uh, on Zoom, and we're going to hear uh, her. We're going to hear Sheila say a few words about Concordia Food Coalition. Um, I don't know if I have to do Hi, anything. Else. <laughs> oh, sorry, Shyla. I mispronounced your name. Uh, but please uh, join me in welcoming both Shaila and Eric today in, in this event. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining in person. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person today. Uh, unfortunately, and just out of an abundance of caution, I'm home in case of being infectious. But luckily I'm able to join you by Zoom. Uh, looks like a full house and I'm happy to see that. Um, just to give you a little bit more, I'm the executive director of the Concordia Food Coalition and if you haven't heard about us before, uh, what we do is we bring together students, faculty, staff and community members to push forward a more just and equitable and ecological transition towards food sovereign campuses. We use educational materials and workshops and presentations like this one. Uh, we incubate new food initiatives on campus. The Hive Cafe Co-op was one of our first working groups. And we try to innovate 
to make better solutions for food campus um, sovereignty. Um, and lastly, we collaborate. We bring together the Concordia food groups um, and the administration to help build sustainable, accessible, and democratic local food systems. We always are looking for volunteers for board of directors or for helping other food groups on campus. And we would love to hear from you if you have any ideas about how we could be making the campus more food sovereign. And with that, I'd like to give it over to Eric, who has been part of our, our project, uh, part of the Food Coalition for 10 years. We're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Um, Eric has been doing this a long time, <laughs> longer than, than I've ever been. Um, thanks, Eric. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. How are you doing today? So thank you for coming out. I know it's Friday afternoon, and uh, this is uh, usually a hard time to get people out, but I'm really happy to see the turnout here. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, as uh, was mentioned, I've been at Concordia now for close to 20 years. I started in the early 2000s, and some of the, uh, the conversations that I bring today is uh, issues that we've been working on for quite a long time. I've been part of different organizations at Concordia, uh, mainly food related, and have helped with different movements and uh, have tried to push the administrative politics at Concordia into a way that I think is a lot better. Our food system is quite broken altogether, and we need to do something about that. Uh, so a lot of the proposals that I'm mentioning here I wrote about in my thesis, but at the same time, I've also tried to present some of this stuff to the Concordia administration with uh, little success in adopting uh, understandings of food sovereignty. So I'm very happy to talk about this today. And uh, as you'll see, uh, I put uh, some papers in front of some of the desks. If you don't have one, you could uh, come to one of the desks here and just pick one up. But this is a framework that I'm uh, proposing in my thesis and something that I really want to spend some time talking about today. So the focus really is going to be about how to build food sovereign campuses. Um, I've given this presentation many times, but uh, usually my presentation focuses on the history of Concordia's food movement. Today, I think it's actually quite appropriate to talk, talk, talk about solutions and to talk actually about devising frameworks that are actually more transformational. So uh, those of you, uh, I know there's some people here from McGill, welcome, thank you so much. And I see some of my students here. Thank you for coming today. Um, before we begin though, you want to go to the next slide? I do want to acknowledge that Concordia is uh, uh, located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganangayaki Nation is recognized as custodians of the land and the waters for which we gather today. Uh, Geojiake, Montreal is also known as a gathering place for First Nations. Today is home to diverse populations of indigenous and other peoples. Respect the continued uh, connections with the past, present, and future, and ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. But even to kind of like extend this a little bit further, uh, our food system has made, been kind of where indigenous food systems have been really replaced by colonial food systems. And uh, indigenous populations across Canada, so-called Canada, have actually experienced uh, very high amounts of food insecurity, have been prevented from doing a lot of traditional practices. And the GMO and all of this kind of like industrialized food has really replaced a lot of indigenous knowledge that is quite important. So I'd like to acknowledge that also. There are indigenous populations that uh, don't have clean drinking water presently. And these are part of these big conversations also. It's not just about re reconciliation, but it's about reparations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great job today. <laughs> so uh, I want to summarize really, like these are the main arguments that I want to put forward today, okay? So I want to, I'm going to show you all of these different things, but the main argument here is that our global food system is causing environmental and social harms. I'm going to show you some of the ways, although I could probably talk about this for hours and just spend my time focusing on that. Uh, I want to also acknowledge that uh, universities are actually part of this equation also. They're hiring large multinational corporations. Uh, I know at McGill, you had kind of a slew of different providers. At Concordia, over the past 20 years, I've actually seen Charwell's, Airmark, and Sodexo here as well. Each of them having different issues, but basically kind of maintaining a very problematic relation to food. And we need to do something about that. And at Concordia, we've been trying, and I'm going to describe to you, you know, what the universities are doing to contribute to this big problem of the global food system. But I also want to focus on the more positive also. So universities could be sites of transformation. There's so many different resources, you know, when it comes to academic funding, when it comes to student labor and all of this stuff that could really help transition communities to become more food sovereign. 
But uh, what I'm going to argue is that we have to go beyond notions of sustainability. I've been talking to Concordia, I've worked with people at McGill and other universities. When we focus on sustainability, we lose the bigger picture. And a lot of time we're not focusing on social transformation, but basically just managing waste, really. I think we need to move beyond that and actually look at more of a transformative approach. So you see in front of you, uh, you have a uh, kind of little like chart of frameworks. I'm going to really mainly be presenting on that today, but I, I need to build a case and I need to show you why I think this is important. And this is really the first time besides my thesis that I actually start to talk about these things. And I really hope that you know students and faculty and even the administration start to take these understandings seriously and we can actually move to a more transformative approach towards our food system. Thank you. <laughs> So I want to start by addressing one argument that is put forth all of the time is that our food system, the way it is now, is necessary because without capitalist food systems, people just starve. And uh, you know, this has kind of been perpetuated. This is the time that we have the most abundance and uh, food is kind of like readily available for everybody. It's not really true. <laughs> Actually, there's more people starving in the world today than there ever have been before, okay? Uh, and uh, if we really deconstruct the uh, economy of our food system, it actually doesn't function. It's not a viable system. We're relying on governments to subsidize funding and then basically selling this food as commodities to other, uh, other countries. And here's a really interesting research by uh, Darren Quailman. Actually looks at the amount of money that is being put in or being made as net profit or net um, sales but if we actually look at the profits that are coming to farmers, we're actually below zero a lot of the time. Why is that? Because farmers are actually relying on external inputs like chemical fertilizers, like seeds. Uh, they're also relying on the pesticides and all of this stuff to grow their food. They're relying on high mechanization. So the idea, hey, let's go <laughs> The idea basically is that we need to like mechanize everything and this is taking a big toll on agriculture and it doesn't make it sustainable environment, uh, economically. Okay? So I want to put this forth because I know a lot of people will say, yes, we can focus on the, you know, the social costs of our food system and we can focus on the environmental costs, but this is the only system that works. I, I don't think it works at all. We can look at the economy of it and it's, it's not functioning. Okay? The farmers are not making money, and this is across the board. It's not just in Canada. If you look at a lot of countries, India has had uprisings from their farmers. If you look across the world, you'll see like very similar patterns. So our food system does not work economically. But if we move past that, it also doesn't work when it comes to our social conditions as well as environmental conditions. Wonderful. <laughs> So if we look at actually uh, the agrochemical and fertilizer companies, what, we're, or what, what uh, could be described here is that there's an extremely high concentration of these companies that are taking place over the last five to 10 years. These multi-conglomerate companies have been buying out each other to the extent that now Bayer controls a lot of the market when agrochemicals and seeds, as well as BASF, and Syngenta, Corteva, all of these corporations basically have been forming these mega mergers. They're the ones that are basically stealing money from farmers because farmers are, have this belief in the system that we actually need to have all of these inputs. If we deconstruct this, if you save your seeds, you don't need to keep buying them. But these seed companies exist and make, make these relationships with farmers to sign these long-term contracts to basically lock them in. So this is quite a problem, especially when we go to the next slide and look at who these companies really are. These companies are responsible for death and destruction across the world. And I don't say that lightly, okay? So if you look at Bayer, they used to be part of a company called IG Farben, who during the World War was basically making Zyklon B for the gas chambers. BASF was actually part of IG Farben also. All of these companies have been responsible for manufacturing like chemical weapons. Union Carbide was actually responsible for a large explosion in Bhopal, India that devastated the country. These corporations have been war corporations that have basically kind of manufactured now since we're not using as many chemical weapons as we did before, they have basically replaced them and, and put it in our food system. To the extent that Monsanto, before Monsanto got bought out by Bayer, would actually brag about that. How they took Agent Orange and are able to split it and put it in our food. And I find that really weird that they're bragging about this on their website. Anyhow, so it's not you know anything disguised, but these corporations, if you look at their histories, their present is just as destructive. So now the chemicals are actually getting put into our food, really destroying uh, the, uh, the soils and having a harmful effect on people also. So these are the companies that are usurping money from our farmers. And if we go to the next slide. Thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit disconnect because <laughs> I have to tell people what to put the slide here. 
so it's, it's not just about the history of these corporations, it's actually about what they're doing presently also, okay? And I know this is a very daunting large list. I kind of did this on purpose in a way that I actually want people to know that there are so many problems here with the food system. And it's not just a matter of like correcting one thing that's going to change anything, but it's actually a matter of looking at the food system itself and constructing a better system from that. Capitalism is largely responsible for a lot of these issues, but we need to figure out what we're going to do with our food systems, and I'm proposing a mechanism of food sovereignty as a framework that we can actually get into these issues, but basically kind of focusing on universities. We go through some of these things. So right now there's about 800 million people in the world that are considered starving. If we actually look at food insecurity across the world, we're actually going over a billion people. So if the world has about like what 7.5 to 8 billion people here, we have like, you know, about a seventh and an eighth of the world that are currently starving. Uh, lack of food sovereignty. So peasants across the world are uh, having a lot of trouble because of food dumping. Canada and the United States and some countries actually finance their farms. And then when they export all of this stuff, it's hard for farmers in local environments to keep up with that. So places like Mexico or other places, the farms don't really, they're not viable because of the imposition of our countries that are basically dumping cheap food commodities. So herbicides, glyphosates actually cause cancer. This has been well identified. Even Monsanto and Bayer have identified this also, although they've been quite resistant to, to that idea. Uh, GMOs, and uh, GMOs and privatization of, uh, of seeds actually restrict access, where we could actually provide people global access to these things. It's not happening. Cost on farmers, I showed you uh, the economy of uh, Canadian farms, so these are not sustainable. Uh, reduction of biodiversity, we actually look at the state of the world right now. We've actually crossed the planetary limitation on the amount of biodiversity that's being lost currently. And we can actually even say that about the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that's being produced also. We've crossed the planetary threshold already. And uh, agriculture is extremely carbon intensive as well. So the products that are going into agriculture, like the pesticides and fertilizers are petroleum based. On top of that, tilling soil actually releases carbons into the environment. We could actually sequester carbons through agriculture, but we're doing something that's extremely harmful for the world. Other things, we're losing indigenous farming methods on stolen land, uh, soil arability, we're actually not experiencing the same kind of soil conditions in a lot of the world. Uh, some of like places in California that, that grow, used to grow a lot of food are becoming deserts now, so we're losing the effect of our soil being able to produce food. Um, there's dead zones in our waterways because of concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus. We have conditions of health. There's a whole bunch of issues. Like I could go through these and probably spend more than an hour just describing all of these things. But I think uh, the point really is our food system is not functioning. It's actually causing a lot of external harms, socially, environmentally, and actually it's not even economically sustainable. Now to focus on campuses. So campuses uh, actually contribute to this as well. We actually, this is a study that I did for my thesis, but I was looking at which companies are uh, the main companies, food service providers in Canada. We find actually Airmark, Chartwells, and Sodexo corner most of the market, okay? They're the ones that have been at Concordia. They've been uh, here for 20 years, all three of those. McGill actually has experienced very similar things. Also, I think at Bain of Hospitality, if I'm not mistaken now, the business model of these corporations are very similar. They basically revolve, rely on kids. <laughs> They rely on captive markets of people that uh, are forced onto their plans. So if you're in prison, you have no choice but to go to the meal provider. And ironically, this is what they're doing to resident students here at Concordia and at McGill and across Canada. To actually look here, I'm looking at, I right, measured how many universities force students onto meal plans, and the majority of them do. So here we have 22 that are mandatory meal plans completely. There's about 24 of them that have hybrid. They actually force some students and allow some people to opt out. And only five of them don't have mandatory meal plans. So what are these organizations, businesses doing really is they're actually relying on captive markets, resident students, so that they can sell them food and they don't have any competition. So the food has been quite horrendous here at Concordia, at McGill and other places. You can actually look at their track record. There's been a lot of publications about how bad their food has been. So if we actually look and deconstruct some of the actions of these companies, Sodexo actually owns private prisons. They own them in Australia, they own them in Europe, and actually to the extent that some of the private prisons have been closed by the Australian government because of malpractice. Okay? Uh, most of their business comes from captive markets, so all of these organizations or corporations that I'm talking about actually uh, operate in prisons, they operate in hospitals, they operate in the military, they basically provide to government services where people are captive to whatever their circumstances are. 
There's issues with food quality. And actually, I'm going to mention this here, but I tied this together. Uh, Airmark is actually responsible for one of the largest prison strikes in the United States in 2017 because of the appalling conditions of their food. Prisoners decided to actually have a coordinated strike across the prisons to say that they don't want Airmark anymore. Uh, there's issues with labor conditions. They've done union busting, and if you actually talk to some of the employees, I would say that uh, some of the backdoor communication is that they're not doing very well when it comes to job relations at Concordia McGill, other places where these uh, organizations operate. And they contribute to these global unsustainable practices that I've been talking about. Okay? Why is this important? It's because we could do something about this, and we could start from universities as transition sites to actually improve local food conditions. So what do we have here at universities is we have teaching and research, and there's been a lot of uh, opportunities for like myself and other professors to actually get students involved into their local food production, distribution, waste management, basically to create an alternative food system. So here at Concordia, there's a couple of professors that have actually allowed students to do uh, community service learning and different opportunities basically to engage with community as part of a course where they could actually get credit for it. And some of these organizations even came out of this at Concordia. Okay. But there's other things as well. So <laughs> universities are like filled with privilege in the way that there's so much money, there's so much like resources being poured into these locations that they become really good sites for social transformation. You know, if we were in engineering and we want to build a bridge, all the resources would come together and we could figure out how to do it. But when it comes to food systems, they're like, let's just hire somebody else and who cares about that? Whatever, we're just going to think of this as a business where we could actually be coming together to think about actually how do we transition food systems to become more sustainable and better for the communities that we reside in. But other things too is that there's a very strong argument by a lot of academics, which I subscribe to also, is that universities are publicly funded here in Canada especially, and they have a duty to provide to communities and to enhance the communities that they're part of. So all of this to say is that this could be a really good transition site to actually start to improve local communities, start to experiment with different ways of doing food, you know, growing food, producing food, distributing food, transforming food, all of these things could be done through universities in connection with communities. And this is where I would like to see universities going. It's not actually just hiring a big multinational corporation, but actually putting researchers and students together to figure out how do we transition our communities to better places. Um, so I'm also pro providing here a food sovereignty framework, and I'm going to show you where this is based on because uh, I'm not the one to invent food sovereignty frameworks, but I'm the first one to apply it to university settings. Uh, there's actually a really strong argument that I want to make is that at the food summit, the Via Campesina, if anyone knows that group, they were the first one to declare that they wanted food sovereignty instead of food security. And they did so because at the UN level, there's been a lot of conversations about food security. The idea basically is that if you get food to people, then that's food security. We just need to figure out like, how do we get people starving food? And uh, what the V Camp Vecina said is that that's not enough. If we do not have the ability to control our own food environments, then it's useless because all we're doing is relying on charity-based models from other places. So they proposed this idea of food sovereignty to root the, the notion of food security into something that actually is about controlling of the people. They can control their own food ways, they can control how it's produced, how it's distributed, and all of the, their aspects of the food system. So I argue the same thing with universities. I've heard so many times from Concordia and I've talked to people at McGill that say, we're going to be sustainable, you know, sustainability is our number one priority. But when it comes to sustainability, like a lot of this is about waste management and, uh, you know, about like just managing small aspects so that we could be a fair trade campus. Really, like, to be a fair trade campus doesn't require many products. Actually, most of the products are not even fair trade, but we could still consider a university fair trade. So a lot of this, in my opinion, is about greenwashing. Okay? Food sovereignty cannot be about greenwashing because it's transformative. It actually tackles the roots of the problem. It goes to actually localize and democratize our food system, where sustainability, like if you look up which corporations are sustainable, McDonald's is sustainable, Coca-Cola is sustainable, like all of the big corporations claim that they're sustainable. So it becomes really confusing for people that don't know much about this. But also it becomes really easy for the administration to greenwash how food and other endeavors function as well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so just to put it out there, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, but uh, this is the model that I keep on hearing from Concordia, but you know, in other respects as well, it's not just Concordia, the triple bottom line approach. So our people are like, oh, sustainability is only met when we have the social, the economic, and the environment all meeting in the middle, and this is where sustainability resides. The person that came up with this 
disavows this model for defining sustainability. What he said is uh, John Huffington said that uh, the models actually made people focus on the economic portion and capitalism through the economic understanding makes people focus on that at the expense of the social and the environmental. Now, uh, if we're looking at notions of strong sustainability, and this is not new, this is actually being taught like for close to 20 years now, we can look at more embedded models, okay? So instead of saying, yes, when we meet all of these things in the middle, it's sustainable, well, the idea is this. All of these systems are dependent on the larger systems. So if we destroy our environment enough so that we can't have it there anymore, we're not going to have an economic system. So we can't see them as equal partners. There's definitely a hierarchy. Okay? The biosphere is allowing us to reside on it so that we can have a social system, and people themselves have created the economic models, the economic system. So we have to think about this approach more, but this has been developed quite well. You can look at uh, uh, the donut model of economics or other things basically as a way to situate uh, embedded models, but also look at planetary limitations. So all of this to say is that even the notions of sustainability that are coming out are based on what they call weak sustainability, and not even strong sustainability that actually understands hierarchies. So what is food sovereignty? Food sovereignty could define a process because you're never really going to be food sovereign, it's always a process in the works. And it's weird to say it that way because a lot of people will think of it like, oh, we're food sovereign at this point. You always have to work with your community through democratic processes to negotiate conditions of your food. And that's how you work towards food sovereignty. Okay? But you could also think about outcomes that are achieved. And a lot of the food sovereignty conversation has gone towards these big meetings that are held, one in Nelene, with uh, actually groups that came across the world. There's 500 delegates, the Canadian Farmers <coughs> Union was there, and a whole bunch of different groups came together and start to understand outcomes. Like, what are they looking for in the food system, and what are they not looking for in the food system? And this is where it becomes interesting, because we can actually look at it as a process base, but the process is to achieve certain outcomes, and these outcomes have to be negotiated continuously. But it can also refer to a comparative framework, and this is what I'm providing on this paper here, is a way to start understanding actually how food sovereignty relates to other food systems and ways that we could actually negotiate. Instead of just having sustainable benchmarks, we could actually have orientations towards better practices. And I think this is really important because if you set a sustainability benchmark, let's just say it like, we're gonna have 50% local food in the summer, usually when you hit 50%, you're done. Okay, you're like, we've achieved it, perfect, wonderful, congratulate, let's pat ourselves on the back. But these orientations go beyond that. They say, we're never really done, we're always actually trying to improve. And if we can look at the conditions that are being set in this framework, then we can always move towards food sovereignty. And we can actually always be better at what we're doing, through negotiations with community, through an ongoing process. But food sovereignty has come to mean a whole bunch of things, so the rights of nations and people to control their own food economy, a paradigm, a trend, a discourse, a regime, a model, which is what I provided there, and I'm going to show you some of the other ones that I've derived this from. A right, so food is a natural right of people. It should be quality, it should be healthy and culturally appropriate. Uh, recognition and respect of women's role in food production, which is a big part of the Lene conference, is that women actually are the largest producers of food across the world, but get little recognition in the process. It's about social justice, it's about environmental sustainability, about a recognition and respect for traditional knowledge in indigenous peoples, agrarian reform, including collective land rights and protection of indigenous peoples' lands, recombining land to defend land from transnational corporations, and against trade liberalization in the way that this has been uh, a big problem when it comes to food dumping and uh, countries not being able to produce food because they're just getting cheaper products kind of dumped into their markets. So also, I could probably talk about this for a while because food sovereignty, depending on how we're looking or in which group actually came up with different definitions, changes where you go. But what I could uh, tell you here is that it's based in transformational sustainability notions. It means that the status quo of what we're doing is not acceptable and we actually have to tackle the roots of the problem, not just manage like waste and other things like that. So, uh, I'm not going to read all of these things to you, but what I want to do is give you a general sense of where my, uh, my uh, framework is coming from. So there's been a number of authors that have actually used what they call food regimes frameworks to start to understand comparative models and to understand where the corporate and food sovereignty models reside. So what they look at is different kind of food issues and how the different corporate or food sovereignty regime responds to these issues. So for example, we look at food 
feeding the world, while the idea in the corporate model is about food access to intensive production based on comparative advantage distribution through market mechanisms. What does that mean, really? It means, actually, the notion that we've been told our whole lives, really, is that the more food we produce, the better it is for everybody. Let's just give corporations power, because we need food production. The more food that's produced, the more people are going to eat. Well, we have about 1.5 times the amount of food to feed the world right now, and we have about a, close to a billion people starving. So it's not working. This is the argument that keeps on being made, but doesn't really have much support to it. If we look at the food sovereignty regime, well, we see food access and security through prioritizing local agriculture production and protecting local markets from dumping and subsidizing food. Okay? So I would love to go through all of these things with you for all of them, but then I'm going to get caught up in not really having time to really focus on the framework that I'm providing here. But I just wanted to show you this, because if you want to actually explore these ideas more, I could actually give you some books and uh, some readings that could actually go more into depth about this. But if I go to the next one, you'll see actually there's not just one approach. Thank you. This is uh, Eric Holt Jimenez and uh, Shatak that came up with kind of a different understanding of the same kind of principles here, but what they're comparing is neoliberal models, reformist models, progressive models, and radical models, and basically saying that if the argument here is the corporate model, we just need to produce food, and the more food we produce, the more people will be able to eat. The reformist model is, okay, yes, we recognize that, but we also understand that people are food insecure, so how do we get food to people, and how do we localize some of the food production? Where if we're looking at food justice, it's rooted in notions of like agroecology and actually connecting more with nature and with people to actually start producing food in a better way, and to relocalize food basically you know, for people by people. And if we're looking at the radical um, food sovereignty approach, the understanding is, dismantle the capitalist food system because it is the thing that's causing the problem and we need to actually replace it with something completely different. So this is also described in here, we could look at it as the corporate model, is that you know, corporations are empowered in, this, uh, in, in the notion of basically producing food through the corporate model, through the development model. It's more about just kind of providing provisions. We understand that capitalism is terrible in the food system, but we're just going to make amends with it, relocalize and try to get food to people. Empowerment, we could actually do something about it, great power to the people, food sovereignty, dismantle the capitalist system, especially the food system, because it's actually not functioning for everybody and we need to actually replace it, okay? So these are frameworks that have been provided and there's like about four or five other ones. They do very similar descriptions, so I didn't want to go through all of this because I could probably spend a lot of time on this also. But if anybody wants more readings about this, come see me. I really want to focus on the kind of applying this to universities. I think that's more important for today. So this uh, kind of situates where I've done my thesis. Uh, I was, I've been at Concordia for about 20 years. I've been part of a lot of activist organization here on campus. I was part of the 2012 strike. I was actually an executive at the Graduate Student Association. You know, a lot of my politics and a lot of my academic kind of pursuit have kind of gone hand in hand. Uh, I have been trying to leverage resources from the university to actually improve communities since I started my graduate studies. But even before that, I've been trying to do that as well. I founded a couple cooperatives here at Concordia, and I'm uh, really working to try to improve the food system. And uh, you know, through that, I've actually focused my PhD research on how we can actually improve the food system at Concordia and provide a framework and a model to actually understand how to even do this at other universities. So hopefully this model is not just a Concordia specific, but actually is something that could be generalized to campuses across Canada, United States, and maybe even the world. So what did I do is I actually used Concordia as a case study. Concordia, as you will see, has a whole bunch of different food organizations that distribute, that uh, transform food. Here we're at a, you know, Reggie's Cooperative. So Reggie's is a student-run bar. That's a solidarity cooperative. Uh, we have the Hive Cafe, another solidarity cooperative. Uh, Could Div Axio is a, um, an organization that uh, I helped found and uh, also is a solidarity cooperative. The idea basically is that we could produce better conditions through democratic governance and basically by rooting ourselves into solutions. Now, through my, my PhD thesis, I was looking at Concordia as an example because of the extent of the food system that we built, the alternative food system. And uh, I know that by actually looking at all of these organizations kind of in their silos, it's really hard to think about systems. So what I want to do is figure out how to connect people in a way that the food sovereignty movements have been doing. In 2014, I started a project basically mapping all of the organizations at Concordia. So the student-run food organizations, or what I call uh, campus community food organizations. 
because the, the food organizations, although they are student run, also have community members that are working there and participate in these organizations also. So I want to map all of these organizations and actually start uh, what they call an action research spiral. So the idea of an action research spiral is if you want to make improvements in your community, you could actually use this method of doing so. The idea basically is you could reflect on the problem and then start to make a plan about actually how to improve the problem. Once you make a plan, you want to put it into action. After putting it into action, we observe how the plan worked and then reflect on that. Did we meet our goals? Did we not meet our goals? And then we can actually start to plan again. And this process you can actually keep doing over and over. So in this idea of food sovereignty, actually the ongoing process of democratization, I think this is a really good approach to take. So what did I do in my thesis? Actually, I started by mapping. So the reflection phase was actually, no, nobody did it here on campus yet. We didn't really know which groups were available, except for like, you know, some of the key staple groups. But there was a lot of groups that people didn't really know about in the bigger picture. So once I did the map, uh, basically the map took place as, as like a website. If you go to uh, concordiafoodgroups.ca, I interviewed uh, like about 50 people or so. I have like 700 video segments of interviews from people that were founding these organizations, people that were part of them, and uh, basically generated a huge resource of information available still to people today. It's a little bit dated now because the last interview I did was 2017, but hopefully actually we continue this endeavor through the Concordia Food Coalition as well. Now, once we have started to understand and reflect, the idea basically is to plan. So what did we do is we got groups together and we started to discuss what it means to actually instill food sovereignty and what it means to actually improve campus food systems. So we had these conversations and you know, to the extent that I wanted the plan to be, it wasn't necessarily a formally structured plan, but we had different orientations that were decided upon by the group. And then we began the acting phase where people actually went back into the organizations and started to think about this and start to develop plans that they could actually participate in. And then the pandemic happened, <laughs> and that's where things came to a halt for a little while. Uh, the good news, though, is that uh, the Concordia Food Coalition has actually resumed uh, the food group assemblies, and we're actually bringing people together again, and hopefully actually going to kind of continue in this mechanism as well, of planning together and figuring out how we could actually devise a better food system and working together towards that. Um, other things that I did too is, uh, so I, I held public conferences and meetings and uh, in enacted this model here that I'm showing you of connecting to the community. So mapping, I was looking at uh, what groups existed up until 2018. I mapped all of the groups at Concordia that were here between 2014 and 18, but actually even looked a little bit beyond that as well. Some groups actually didn't exist at Concordia anymore, but I kind of put them into the map anyway. Uh, and we're looking at, uh, you know, how could we actually develop a better food system you know, what, what does this mapping really tell us when it comes to like actually planning this food system? What is it that Concordia students actually build here at Concordia? The other thing I did is a historical analysis, which actually hasn't been done. I traced the history of all of the campus food organizations from 1966 until now. <laughs> does anyone know when Concordia came into fruition? 1972, so it actually started way before that. Uh, actually, the hall building here was built in 1966. They had a greenhouse on the roof. It was actually a food cooperative here a long time ago, but uh, a lot of this was hard to get information about because it was basically like traces in newspapers and different things, and I couldn't find anyone that were part of like the older kind of incarnations of these food groups. But uh, you know, from about 1992 onwards, um, a lot of groups actually still reside. So the Frigo Bear actually started in about 1992 and uh, still are here on campus. And People's Potatoes started in 1998 and are still here on campus also. So like kind of the movement that still exists on campus really started in the 1990s onwards and I have really good historical traces of this movement through video interviews and basically doing historical archive. So public discussions, like I was showing you with that model before of action research, uh, so we led public discussions and part of this is not just about like getting research so that I can put it into my thesis, Ironically, actually, I published this website and put all of the interviews on my website even before I actually wrote my thesis. And somebody wrote a master's thesis on my information before I was able, able to complete. So that's great. Uh, like, this is the whole goal of what I was putting out. A lot of times, if you're in research, they tell you, like, hoard all of your research so you can publish it. But, like, I'm trying to decommodify the knowledge base as well. 
And food sovereignty framework is uh, actually devised the food sovereignty framework for my thesis, but this has never been done before, so this is something quite exploratory. And I want to actually provide a framework that I think is better than actually applying sustainability measures. So here are some of the results that I found, and I'd love to go in detail through all of these groups, but I think that's for another talk. If anyone comes to uh, the CFC's 10th year party, I will actually talk about some of these groups and their history in a little bit more detail. But just to show you, actually, what, what I did is I mapped the production, processing, distribution, waste management. So mapping a food cycle. I also took uh, considerations from, if anyone knows Gibson Graham's research, they actually uh, look at uh, you know, different starting points to actually understand a diverse economy. So I kind of used some of that as well to identify market-based and non-market-based entities and initiatives. But really, this follows the food cycle. So what groups produce on campus, process, distribute, and do waste management. We found actually a number of groups that grow on campus, so growing food, a number of groups that grow off campus, uh, groups that actually do like foraging as well. So they meet up on campus and then they go do foraging out in Mount Royal or by uh, the Lachine Canal in different places. But I also identified knowledge bases also, so knowledge production. We had a whole bunch of different conferences here at Concordia, Transitions Conference, we're doing one right now, but we've been doing these things for quite a long time. So since the incarnation of the CFC, 2013-14 onwards, we've actually had a whole bunch of different conferences to get people involved in their food system here. Anyway, so all of these different conferences took place. We have uh, groups that were doing transformation here on campus, so the People's Potato, uh, you know, actually, I guess you have like a kitchen that does some transformations here at Reggie's. Uh, there's a couple, like there's a group at Loyola Campus, uh, Loyola Free Lunch that do transformation stuff. So there's a whole bunch of different groups that contributed to that as well. We looked at distribution. So we looked at uh, market-based distribution, the Hive Cafe. You actually have to pay for food, but if you go to the People's Potato, you don't. You're actually paying a fee levy, and it's about $10 a year, you get access to food. So this is really interesting in the mapping, because if we're looking at ways to actually improve food security, that is definitely a way to do so. You could actually have access to food if you don't have money in your pockets. Uh, we also looked at uh, uh, grocery store outlets, so like things uh, like the Frigo Bear, we had like different markets. Concordia Farmers Market now is a really good example. And people that uh, are groups that provided like free donated food and donated seedlings and all of these other things, so market and non market based. Uh, we also looked at waste management initiatives also, and unfortunately, actually, Concordia used to do composting here on campus, and they stopped doing so in the early 2000s. And uh, there's been a lot of conversation about getting it going. They really haven't kind of bought into that yet. But there are initiatives to actually encourage people to put their compost in different areas in the garbage. And uh, Concordia basically ships their compost to Ontario to process it there. Hopefully, we can actually get better facilities here to do composting. Because if we actually look at a food cycle, we want to improve it. It means this doesn't become waste anymore. It becomes nutrients back to the garden. And all of a sudden, we could actually have more of a closed loop system and hopefully like improve the uh, campus food conditions. Now, um, part of my analysis is actually to look at how these organizations came into fruition. Like what facilitated the creation and perpetuation of, of this food system itself? Number one is student activism. So Concordia students, congratulate yourselves because you've been really amazing in the process of doing food activism and even just activism in general. I came to Concordia for my PhD, my master's, and my undergraduate because this was the place to actually do activism. And not to like put down McGill, but I don't know, I guess McGill wasn't doing it as much, and so that's why. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's been really good initiatives at McGill coming from food activists there also, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can actually bridge some of the stuff between McGill and Concordia, and I'm glad you're all here, so. Uh, other things too is that there are some professors that do community service learning or community campus engagement. Myself, Satoshi Aikida, and a couple other professors were actually allowing students to do projects in their class, and some of these things actually came into fruition. Uh, myself and Satoshi actually guided a group of uh, people that wanted to make a beer making co-op, and actually maybe it sounds weird, but uh, this is actually what they were really into in class, and the idea basically was to transform Reggie's into like a brew pub. <laughs> And we were almost there. <laughs> so long story short, uh, there was an initiative right across the street called Burritoville. So it was a, a business that was purchased but turned into a cooperative. And the idea was that we would take the basement of Burritoville to do a brewing, kind of like a capacity for a, uh, brewing beer for here at Reggie's. And actually at one point, there was one of the beers that was made. It's a group called Brasseur Illuminé. Okay. Uh, eventually, they kind of transitioned to do more workshop-related stuff and focus less on production. And then, unfortunately, we lost Burrito Bill. It didn't work out in the bigger picture for multiple reasons. 
But anyhow, so that kind of initiative fell apart. But you know, the good thing is, is they had a good run for about five years, and they did have a beer here that was locally produced by that organization. There's other initiatives that have come out of our courses. This was uh, kind of an, uh, a way to actually instigate a lot of these kind of like campus actions. So anyone that's faculty, pay attention to those things because these are really important. Fee levies. Concordia has a huge fee levy system. Without fee levies, you would not have the People's Potato. You wouldn't have the High Free Lunch. You wouldn't have a lot of these amazing organizations. Uh, it's been kind of contentious at times, depending on who's in the CSU, which I'm going to get to a little bit later on. But fee levies have been a very strong thing that have actually helped perpetuate a lot of these food organizations. Robust support system. Concordia has a sustainable action fund. They have Cuper. They have a whole bunch of different organizations that have provided a lot of support to the organizations. Cuperg actually is the one that founded the Free Bear. It came as a working group from Cuperg that eventually emancipated and became its own entity. So these are very strong points. Anybody that actually wants to start a food movement at their university, these are the ways that actually Concordia has really perpetuated the system that they have. But uh, there's a whole bunch of things that really kind of worked against us also. And uh, I've identified some of these things. And anybody here that's interested in the food movement, these are some of the things that we need to avoid. <laughs> Number one, the administration has been pretty difficult to deal with from time to time, and sometimes they provide a resource to us, but other times they become huge barriers because they're the ones hiring all of these big external corporations where we could be doing a lot of this in, like, internally. Uh, they're extremely risk aversive, okay? So for them, it's a business, and if your business doesn't make money, then they don't really care for it, okay? So a lot of the time it's like, are you gonna be viable? And they look around, just try to compare what we're proposing to the organizations around. And we'll say, hey, Burrito Bill didn't work. It's not a viable thing. We don't really trust that you can actually put together some of these organizations. People's Potato have been making bids to Concordia to actually take over the, uh, the food system in the early 2000s especially. And the administration told them that they would never exist past like a couple years. They're still around. It's been over 20 years here. So, you know, there, these organizations could be viable, especially if they're rooted in you know, the constituencies and people that are actually perpetuating these things. So viability food operations, there's a couple of groups that actually no longer exist. The admin seem to have dwelled on some of these things as reasons why we can't actually improve our food system here. Corporate model of university food services. Uh, most universities that hire external corporations make a certain percentage of profits. And uh, Concordia, through this model, makes money off of it. So by forcing resident students to buy into the meal plan and then hiring Airmark or Chartwells or Sodexo, they're basically guaranteeing a revenue without any risk whatsoever because the risk is on the food service corporation itself. Little happens, they basically just don't make money, but this is what they're in it for, they're in it for the money. View of sustainability, the triple bottom line model is the one that's usually projected in administrative meetings that I have. So we have to balance the economic with the environment and the social. And like I was showing you, this is a very outdated model and things that have actually led to social and environmental harm. The request for proposal process. This is quite complicated, but it's basically legal requirements for publicly funded institutions to go through a formal process if they're actually vetting like large corporations, okay? Now, a way out of this basically is that Concordia or other universities could do an internal model, and then they don't need to vet external companies. But in the RFP process, there's like a lot of, kind of conditions that make it very difficult for anyone to win the, the bid except for these big multinational corporations. One part of the our last RFP is that Concordia puts uh, amounts of money that the Food Service Corporation needs to actually have made in revenue over a certain amount of time in a university location. So one of the bids, actually the last bid was $5 million. You had to make over $5 million a year, and you'd have to work for five years in a university in order to even qualify. The, uh, the previous uh, one that Airmark just won, they actually reduced it to 3.5 because we were arguing that it's really hard for any local uh, group to actually bid on this. Like it basically just prioritized the big multinationals. So that was a huge constraint and actually it makes it so that, you know, Airmark Chartwell, Sodexo, and Dana Hospitality get priority over the bidding because they actually have over $5 million of sales and have been in universities. It basically prevents any student from saying, hey, I've got a good idea and it's viable, here's a business plan, they'll basically say no. So the administration have been a big barrier. But, you know, to be fair, there's other barriers also. So students have been barriers amongst themselves also. There are a lot of people that are what I call anti-activists, or people that push back on any kind of like radical or progressive politics. And the CSU seems to go in waves, you know? You get a progressive group come in, great, and still a bunch of stuff, and then the year after, all of a sudden, it's another group, and they basically try to dismantle everything that happened. It becomes really complicated. Uh, fighting amongst activists. I've seen so many groups that actually get along really well on most of the fundamental principles, 
but still figure out a way to cannibalize each other. And uh, anyone that works in progressive politics probably knows what I'm talking about. So this has been very difficult because it actually has been detrimental to a lot of really amazing movements. Uh, the other one is student turnover and kind of lack of experience. So students are here usually for about four years or so, and then usually they move on. I'm the only one that ever signs here for 20 years, apparently. Uh, but, you know, this causes a lot of, like, turmoil within organizations. So new people come in and all of a sudden they're like, we want to do something different, and whatever the case is, it doesn't provide very good stability. It's good to have community members that actually help with stability in some of these organizations, because if you have continuous turnover, it's really hard to, like, generate momentum and keep it going. Faculty, I would say, especially at Concordia, there's been a lack of engagement. Besides a couple of us, there's not many people that are actually doing kind of the work of getting students involved in these organizations. We could really step it up as faculty here and uh, you know try to benefit the surrounding communities through different different things in their courses. And skewed competition. Multinational corporations have a lot of power when it comes to like reading legal documents. So if anyone's read an RFP before, it's like 500 pages or more of legalese in French, because it has to be French, because it's Quebec. Uh, and to read through that is extremely complicated. I've read through it, and I don't understand all of it, even though I try really hard. Uh, people like Airmark, Chartwell, Sodexo, they hire legal teams, they come in, basically it's all translated for them, All everything's put together. Any other organization that doesn't have the money for that is at a loss. So here are some key findings that uh, I'd like people to take away from my research here. So I'm looking at how do we actually start to devise food sovereign campuses and how do we do so through kind of the benefit of all of the organizations that have come out of Concordia, how can we think of this as a food system? And here are some of the findings that I think are, are really important. So food sovereignty can be described as social justice outcomes on campus, like policies, organizational procedures, reflected through bylaws and constitutions, and or bans on harmful practices. So like I was saying, when it comes to outcomes, we could set different standards of what we actually want to see on campus. Now, if we don't want bottled water to be on campus, that's something to actually set as standards and conditions. We could also say, you know, labor practices could be up to certain standards also. We could set these different standards through collective meetings and actually figure out how to have all of the groups participate in these kind of movements. Food sovereignty is an ongoing process of negotiation with others who are actively trying to transform the food system. Like I was saying before, you're like never just food sovereign and that's it. It's always a constant negotiation because a new group of people will be there and you actually have to negotiate with them as to what terms and conditions they would like for their food system also. Food sovereignty is not a reformist movement. It's transformation. Okay? The premise of food sovereignty is that we're not accepting the status quo. We recognize the harms of capitalism in the food system and actually want to dismantle that to actually build a better food system itself. Um, a food sovereign campus is controlled by students, faculty, the Concordia community and the community at large, and to create positive value to these constituencies. So Airmark at Concordia provides food to resident students, but they don't provide anything else to the community. Like my argument really is they provide a lot of negative externalities, okay? Our food system at a university could actually benefit the communities that they're part of. Could you imagine like having like a dining center that people really want to come to because the food is actually grown locally either on campus or close by, you know, it's, it's done in a way that uh, people actually are beneficial to be employees there, also part of the democratic process. We could really start to change things by actually initiating these kind of conversations instead of like how can we just make this into a business model. Uh, so a food sovereign campus does not force students onto a meal plan so that large market multinational corporations and universities through profit loss model can receive financial returns. To me this is like a no-brainer but has been one of the most difficult things that, to convince Concordia of is to actually emancipate students from these mandatory meal plans. I think this would be a game changer because it means that the food service corporation actually needs to do something better in order to maintain their business. And right now they just have a captive market, they don't care. They, like, food quality could just be like, whatever, we still have our business regardless. Food sovereign campuses are made up of social enterprises that practice an array of diverse economy practices. Okay, so they should be actually rooted in communities, through cooperative non-profits, basically not to make as much profit by externalizing all of these costs. A food sovereign campus is more radical than corporate and weak sustainability approaches and should be differentiated through the framework that I provided here, which I'm going to go over in detail as well. Even though food sovereignty is hard to define and apply to university campuses, sustainability is equal, equally confusing and often upholds unsustainable practices. So like I was saying, by using the term food sovereignty, we're talking about transformational practices. 
By saying sustainability, I cannot guarantee that'll happen. And I will say, actually, most of the time, we're probably not talking about these things. We're talking about like minor waste management and minor localization of food. Okay? So I have this in front of you, but I know this is really hard to read on the screen here. So if you uh, want to take a look, this is a food sovereign campus <coughs> framework that I've provided and I've built in my thesis. And how did I do that? I kind of looked at those other frameworks that I showed you before, okay? What am I comparing here? I'm comparing corporate food practices with what I call soft sustainability or weak sustainability practices, and then food sovereignty, frame, uh, food sovereignty uh, applications. So if we go to the next slide, and we can actually break this down so it's a little bit better visible here. So what I was looking at, what are the food issues that we're addressing, okay? So we could look at who runs the food services. Well, in a corporate approach, we have external corporations. So the university will hire an external corporation, basically trying to make profit off of them as best as possible. In the soft sustainability approach, we're looking at external corporations or self-operating. So there are some universities that actually do their operations themselves, and some of them have been better, not necessarily all of the time. But what I would like to see is a food sovereignty approach where campus community stakeholders and partnerships of faculty and students and administrators and staff and the community at large. All of these people should be constituents in actually devising their own food system itself. We can have faculty actually participating in this through like mechanisms like I was talking about. But like at Concordia, there's very good demonstrations about how students can actually lead a lot of these initiatives also. So approach to sustainability, if you ask Airmark how sustainable they are, they'll probably come up with a lot of different responses to this, but I would say they're not really that concerned about it altogether except for their image. When it comes to Concordia itself, they usually use the soft sustainability approach, basically referring to the triple bottom line, meeting all of these conditions of environment, economic, and social all together, and that's their version of sustainability. But what we need is a transformative approach to sustainability that includes social justice, decolonization, and anti-racism. Okay? These have to be a notion that we actually put into sustainability, not just about managing garbage. Uh, goals of the campus food services. So from the corporate response, basically profiting from a captive market of resident students. What does the university think about that? Well, they're providing food to a captive market of resident students. But what we should really have is a, a transformative approach, oh sorry, uh, improve the foodscape on campus and the surrounding communities. So all of these things could actually lead to positive externalities in the community if we could devise it properly. So we're looking at business model, oh sorry, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, we're looking at business model. The for-profit is actually the more of the corporate model. This is what the university loves because they make money off of it. But we could have for, uh, non-profit or for-profit. But what I would like to see in the food sovereignty framework is that the social enterprise and social innovation approach basically means that it benefits the people that are involved, provides democratic governance of some sort, and actually is meaningful for the people that are involved. So we can look at the constituency. So I broke this up as to like, how do people participate in the food system? So if we actually look at the corporate approach, faculty involvement, they're potential customers, because maybe they'll come buy food. Uh, if we look at the soft sustainability approach, faculty are potential customers and consultants. Sometimes they ask us our opinion here and there. Uh, and actually when it comes to students, they'll ask you about consultation on your food also, but in the way of like, do you want spaghetti or pizza? To me, that's not a really good consultation, it's basically just preferences. Uh, but we can look actually at a food sovereignty approach. So faculty are stakeholders and co-create the food system through research and community service learning projects. So we can actually do this in our classrooms and actually instigate really amazing initiatives through classrooms. So involvement of students. Students are the main customers of the corporate approach. They're also consultants about their food preferences and soft sustainability. But in the food sovereignty approach, they're co-creators of the campus food system also. And this is what's happening at Concordia. I've seen actually incarnations of this at McGill and other places also. We can create conditions of our own as we system. Involvement of the community at large. So the community at large, our potential customers are not important in the corporate model. The community at large are not the main focus of food services and soft sustainability, but beneficiaries and partners with the campus food system that creates community value. So we can actually provide value to the community by transforming food on campus. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you examples later on of the farm at Loyola, but there's a lot of people that live in NEG that actually reside around the farm that are getting a lot of benefit through like volunteering with us, you're getting like more affordable food baskets by localizing food and all of these different issues. Um, so con consultations about the food system. If we're looking at corporate food system, we have uh, part of a market making strategy, so they really want to know how to sell best to the constituencies. 
Uh, and when it comes to soft sustainability, we're looking at consultations about food preferences led by the administration, which happens about once a year here. But like I'm saying, you know, it's about what are your choices? Like, do you want to eat you know, spaghetti or uh, rigatoni today? Great, same thing, whatever. Uh, but we can actually have it led by a federation or coalition or network of campus community food organizations. So right now with the Concordia Food Coalition, we actually are instilling these food assemblies and we're inviting all of the groups to come participate in conversations actually about improving campuses and actually how we could build more of a food sovereignty approach. Although we're not maybe naming it that yet, that is what is taking place. So how do we address food insecurity on campus? Well, the corporate aspect, they don't really care much about that because if you don't have money, you're not going to Airmark. Simple as that. University through uh, soft sustainability measures basically provide food options for people. They have like uh, food banks and different things. But if we actually look at a food sovereignty approach, we need a holistic approach uh, connecting people to food production and processing distribution on campus and the community at large. And this is how we start to transform food systems, basically involving people in it. Uh, how are employees treated? So if we look at the corporate approach, well, they want to provide as little money to employees as possible because this is a, a big extent of their, their expenses. So the more you could actually externalize the costs onto the employees and reserve money from them, the more money you make. When it comes to uh, soft sustainability approaches, laborers are treated with respect and are paired fair wages, but excluded from decision-making process and not really paid their true value because to be profitable means that a lot of the money is actually coming off the backs of the workers. Uh, we can actually look at another approach, though, where laborers are involved in decision making and are not exploited via wages, given proper benefits to lead a fulfilling life. Okay, so we could be involved. Like a lot of the organizations around here attempt to do that, and maybe like are not providing fulfilling lives at this moment, but are trying to work towards that and at least involving people in decision making processes when it comes to like their labor and all of the other things that come to the organization. So food, food procurement. All purchasing from large distributors to drive down the cost of food. So Airmark, Chartwells, and all this go to like Gordon or Cisco or these big kind of food providers who get the cheapest food across the world as possible. They purchase that because that's how you make money off food systems. But we can also looking at purchasing food from local farmers at the lowest price possible. This is more of a soft sustainability. If you want to be transformative to food sovereignty, it means purchasing food at a fair price from a network of local farmers that hire workers for fair wages and or where possible, grow food in and around campus through farmers co-op, uh, cooperatives of faculty, students, and the community at large. We could really change the way that universities interact with food, and basically we could stabilize a lot of farms that are having difficulties right now, especially the ones that are more based in agroecology or regenerative natures. And finally, environmental stewardship. If we're looking at the corporate model, they're basically trying to externalize the environmental cost because that's how you become profitable. In weak sustainability, you're looking at reducing the waste, waste and, uh, and procure food locally when possible. But if we're looking at a food sovereignty approach, we want to have a holistic approach that reconnects people to the biosphere, to food practices, regenerative agriculture, and decolonization. So this is a framework that I've come up with, all right? And I've shown the university this framework to which uh, they still abide by their sustainability approach. I think this is way more meaningful. And I think the approach to food sovereignty actually could have an impact on the campus, but also on surrounding communities. I think more importantly, that if we actually want to improve the conditions of our food, we actually need to think beyond them just you know, these soft sustainability approaches or the corporate approach. We can empower corporations as much as they, we want, but basically they just make money off of us and they're destroying the world in the process and causing a lot of social harm. So I would love universities, but also communities to start thinking about more food sovereignty relations. And this is something that is tangible that could actually be adopted and applied. But it's gonna come a lot through negotiation and through you know, the movement of, of students and faculty to actually start to enforce these different practices. Now, I, my last kind of uh, slide here to talk about food sovereign campuses, these are like beginning approaches. So I didn't know who my audience would be today. I don't know if it would be Concordia students, McGill students, people on Zoom even. <laughs> so I kind of made these quite general and I could be a little bit more specific if people have follow-up questions or if you want to talk about this after. But uh, students, if you want to actually participate in developing food sovereign campuses, you can develop an alternative campus community food system you can challenge some of the oppressive campus food practices. You can create food coalitions and food group assemblies and basically participate in this action research spiral that I was talking about. Okay. You can also set conditions like they have in, in different uh, places like Nelene where they're talking about food sovereignty and set conditions for this. Faculty, 
practice critical participation or participatory action research and involves community campus organizations. If faculty were to do this more at Concordia, I think this would be really impressive and really great. There are a couple people that do this, but it, by and large, I would love more faculty to do this. Assign community service learning and community campus engagement, as well as what they call community-based learning assignments. Very similar, but basically have different approaches and different names. But we could get students in our courses to actually start to engage with external food relations and hopefully either you know, help and lend hands to community organizations or actually build internally structures that could actually even have an impact on the community. There's multiple examples, and actually uh, I see Elliot here, so I don't want to pick on you, but uh, part of actually uh, uh, one of our initiatives actually in a course that Elliot was in, uh, we actually engage with the Lachine community to set up local markets. And uh, through that, actually, there was a farm that I've been uh, kind of looking after for about two years, the Duffport Urban Farm. I've had hundreds of students come and help out at this farm. And people like Elliot and other people have actually gone and done assignments that actually really benefit the community. We've actually done surveys about how to improve food conditions in Lachine. And these things could be really important. I think that actually engaging people in classroom activities that improve communities is something that most professors should be doing if we want to critically engage with the world in positive ways. Direct research funds and other resources towards campus community food systems. So I have uh, written lots and lots of grants and have uh, helped to benefit a lot of the organizations that I can here. But I think uh, if more faculty were involved in research, legitimizes a lot of the work that's taking place, provides resources to a lot of initiatives here on campus. Administration, and I don't see any administrators here, although I've invited them all. <laughs> that's okay. So uh, adopt a food sovereignty approach instead of soft sustainability or corporate approach to campus food services. They could actually take a look at this and start to work towards more of a food sovereign campus. Do not force students and residents to buy a meal plan. It seems so trivial, but it's been very difficult to negotiate these terms. Build or hire social economy based food service providers. Don't hire the big three and even the big four, I guess we're going to lump data hospitality in there. We could actually do a lot better by internalizing the food system basically communicating with ourselves to build conditions of food sovereignty and engagement through you know, negotiations, through food assemblies, through food coalitions, and active discussions that are ongoing. So this is a food sovereign campus. I kind of wanted to end by showing you some uh, photos of some of the stuff that we're doing here at Loyola campus. So I know like a lot of the stuff I described today was quite theoretical, and thank you for enduring that because I usually like to tell more stories about the groups here and show pictures and stuff, but I figured I would end with this. Um, so this is a plot of land that resides at Loyola campus. Uh, I, myself and uh, some students at Concordia, some of my former students actually, initiated a group called Co-op Côte de Vaction. So this is a solidarity cooperative. Our goal really is to actually provide conditions of food sovereignty by growing food on campus. Uh, basically trying to link like a farm to plate with groups like the Hive and other groups on campus, but to provide local CSAs at affordable rates for students. But I think more meaningfully too, to actually pay farmers properly. We look at one of the most exploited people in the world, it's actually people that produce food. Uh, anyhow, so this is our initiative. You can see actually like uh, about a quarter of an acre of growing space. We obtained this last year from another group, City Farm School, and uh, just basically started our activities. You can see some of our co-op members here planting peas. This is one of the first things we plant early in the season. Probably going to do it soon when uh, we know that there's not going to be very cold weather. Peas are tolerant to cold a little bit, so anyways. But uh, you'll notice actually as we go through the slideshow. So you go to the next one. We have more planting. You can see actually some of the products that were harvested. We have like a whole bunch of leafy greens. We use uh, insect netting. This is actually part of a course that we designed. So Concordia does not offer urban agriculture in the summer. I actually teach it in uh, fall usually, although this year it's being offered in the winter. <laughs> so we don't have conditions of actually bringing people out in the winter. It's kind of ridiculous. Anyways, our co-op actually uh, founded um, an urban agriculture uh, education program and certificate. And good news, uh, we actually had uh, wrote a grant and were able to offer 23, students to, uh, 23 places to Concordia students this year in the program. So we're going to launch that as of Monday. Keep your ears open if you want to be part of the program. There's limitations to how many people we could take in, but uh, if you want to apply, that would be wonderful. Anyway, so this is part of the education programs. You can see some of the students engaging with plants, learning how to grow things. You can see actually we do a lot of vertical growing, so what we call spin farming is small plot intensive. It means really pack it in wherever you can. Don't leave any space. So we do a lot of like vertical growing. These are tomato trellises. You can see other things as well, like well, we have cucumbers growing vertically, a whole bunch of different plants. 
Uh, this is actually a spot where Sankofa, a collective uh, black indigenous farm, is uh, now uh, actually help, or helping with the, the plot also. Uh, so we're sharing space with another group, but this was kind of the space at the beginning. We're planting some perennial stuff in a very rocky area that uh, now Sankofa is going to be looking after this year. So here's just some of the produce. We have kale, you have scallions, you have like spinach, you have a whole bunch of different things. So here are carrots being harvested as well. Uh, you can see actually the abundance when I'm saying we really cram it in, like you can tell here, you really cram it in. So you have eggplants, you have peppers, you have like climbing things. The insect netting is really important because we don't use any chemical pesticides or fertilizers. Uh, everything is naturally based and actually insect netting really helps with uh, any insects we can attack the plants. Here's a mushroom uh, endeavor that uh, one of the members of our, our cooperative, Nico, who's actually really amazing at growing mushrooms, set up in the basement of this little bunker that we have at Loyola, full mushroom growing. Uh, and actually, Nico offers workshops to people. If people are interested, uh, I would say check out our website and uh, you can actually learn how to grow mushrooms in your own home. Even. So here's just some uh, mushrooms. These are uh, oyster mushrooms, pink oyster mushrooms. And you can see them growing out of the buckets there. Basically, you put little kind of like pinhole drills in, in the bucket and uh, the mycelium colonizes and basically grows outwards and we produce mushrooms. There's more mushrooms, so red wine cap mushrooms and different varieties. You can see actually some of our volunteers and people that were part of the school growing some stuff. We have carrots, we have kale, carrot growing. It's a nice little picture, I guess, in a brick, whatever. You can see actually a good harvest of purple carrots here and uh, a lot of other things growing, so like squash even, and a whole bunch of different things. So we do a lot of like uh, intercropping, basically like if you want to confuse insects, you don't plant everything in one place, but if you have it like dispersed, then insects have a lot of more trouble finding it, although they still usually find a way. Here's an example of all the colorful carrots that we produce, as well as like fennel, kale, arugula, and there's more of the insect netting, so you can see like this is the darker part, or darker, I guess the uh, more shaded area of the garden. So this is where we grow a lot of the leafy things. There's a big tree on this side that actually shades. We have uh, a whole bunch of other things as well, leafy greens. These are beets. This is kind of a washing station, where I think the next slide shows the washing station. Yeah. So here's the washing station, and here you can see actually how tall the trellises is. The trellises are, John Nathaniel is actually really tall, and uh, they're like towering over him here. So. They're about like eight, nine, ten feet, if you get exactly the measurement, but they go up quite high and you can run tomato plants like right up through a wire. You see like uh, other things, uh, mushrooms, these are microgreens, so not only are we producing in a farm, but we're doing it year-round in the Concordia greenhouse. We have microgreens available, you have scallions, you have basically a CSA harvest, which is a weekly uh, basket of food that you could get from Cult of Action, uh, grown basically at the greenhouse here, and mushrooms that are available from uh, the Lyola space as well. There's more of uh, our produce, so scallions, got beets, you've got like hakurai, which I don't know if people know here. Hakurai is basically, it's like a turnip, a Japanese turnip. It kind of tastes like a radish, but it's not spicy. It's like a non-spicy radish. We have uh, radishes. Here's our market stand at Loyola. So this here is, we set up like this cart and we have local CSA, which basically means it's community supported agriculture. People sign up for baskets and they receive baskets for the whole summer. But then we have produce available also. So if people want to walk by and get stuff from our local markets, they can. And this is our market downtown as well. So here's downtown. We, uh, last year we were doing Wednesday at Lyola. And then we bring all of the leftover produce here downtown. And then after that, whatever's left over is donated or repurposed in different ways, sold for cheaper costs or whatever the case is. So this is one example of an organization, but there's so many of them. Like I didn't talk about the People's Potato or High Free Lunch. I could probably spend a lot of time showing you picture slideshows of that too. But this is where it's gonna happen. So uh, on the uh, 13th of April, we actually have a Concordia Food Coalition. It's our 10th year anniversary. And I'm actually gonna go into a little bit more of the history of Concordia's food organizations, which is another part of my thesis that I don't really have too much time to spend on today. But I want to thank you all for listening to me. I know a lot of this was theoretical and this is uh, like a lot to take in in one shot. But uh, I really want people to start orienting to think about how to develop food sovereign campuses. And not to say abandon the ideas of sustainability, but I don't believe that the notion of sustainability has served us very well. Uh, sustainable development was coined in like, what, 1987? And since then the world is in a worse place. So I think we need to look at more transformative mechanisms. And if we're looking at foods, food sovereignty is the approach to do that through. 
So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming out. And I'm happy to take any questions, concerns, or comments. Yeah, so the question was about uh, what does food dumping mean? So uh, there are certain countries that uh, don't uh, subsidize their food through their governments, so it becomes more expensive. Canada provides subsidies to farms, so it actually becomes cheaper to produce. Now, if our food is cheaper to produce, we can go sell it in other local markets, like in Mexico or you know, in different places across the world, and we can actually uh, provide it for cheaper costs than their local farmers. So it sounds good because people are like, oh, it's cheap food, but what it does is actually undermines the ability of the farmer to sell their food, and eventually the farmer can't actually keep on doing what they're doing, and uh, a lot of times go bankrupt because of that. So it actually undermines local farming capabilities. So that's what they call food dumping, is just dumping cheaper food into locations, basically to sell it. Yes. Um, I am one of the McGill students uh, who is here to learn today. Wonderful. And um, I'm curious if you have any strategies or like what your experience has been talking about food sovereignty. I think like to students, I think food sovereignty is less familiar of an idea than you know the phrase affordable food or or even food security, which can still be sometimes unfamiliar. I think we are. A new campaign is emerging at our campus, and we are still figuring out how we want to uh, explain this to people. Like, what is the narrative that is effective of, of achieving the goals you're talking about, but also not alienating students over language or like. Also, if a student, I think sometimes students don't want to think. Their instinct is that it, they won't be involved. Like, you know, for example, a cooperative cafe or a student-managed cafe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are some of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about. For sure. So look, to be fair, it's difficult to frame things, especially when it comes to movements. So I'm using the term food sovereignty, but I could say that a lot of other people might describe it as something else. So some other people might say it's a food justice movement or, you know, uh, about providing like food and uh, relieving food insecurity. Um, I don't like to use the term food insecurity unless I'm actually specifically talking about that. Uh, as a movement though, it seems to focus a lot on like charity based models. So how is it that we could just provide like free or cheap food provisions to like students or faculty or people in general? Uh, I think we need to root the problem more in like the actual food system itself. It's not just about providing like charity based conditions, but actually actually solving the problem through people's engagement. And it could be difficult because not everybody has time for that on a campus and there's like different ways that groups develop. It was easy for us at Concordia coming off of the 2012 strike, there was so much momentum here that a lot of the food organizations that exist now are basically part of that product. People were like, okay, you know, the lobbying the government didn't really work very well. We're actually really interested in, in founding new organizations and, and kind of like taking matters into our own hands. So we've largely benefited from that, but uh, you know, I think the notion of, of uh, food sovereignty came about because a lot of people are talking about local control. And uh, we had a, a, a conference one year, it was uh, something like, um, what's, the, you know, what's the goal of local control, is basically what we termed it. And the idea is that we need to take democratic control of our own food environment. Uh, people in residence actually experience pretty negative repercussions at times because they're not given choices as to what they want. And uh, you know, a lot of people in residence they come to me in my class and they're like, you know, the food was not acceptable or they didn't give me the proper dietary conditions or whatever the case is. So the idea basically is we could do better than that. Like we could actually take it upon ourselves to change that system. But you know, then we still have the multinational corporations that are still providing these food to resident students and forcing them onto the plan. So I think for us, like it's about kind of removing that as well. Uh, it's about challenging these multinational corporations and emancipating the resident students, but also developing something that actually has positive effects on the world that we're surrounded by as well. Now, how to do that as a movement is difficult because you have to address the things on campus that are meaningful for people that are there. So we can't like necessarily just define the movement for them, but I would say if you could talk about a lot of the kind of conditions that I put forward today, hopefully a lot of people resonate with that and actually maybe we'll strive towards these goals. Uh, but things that could actually really help is that, you know, the Concordia Food Coalition has been kind of a pillar here at helping organizations establish and kind of connecting them together. And uh, fee levies have been really important. Like the People's Potato couldn't exist without it and the High Free Lunch and other things like that. 
So you know, all of this to say is that focus on I think the way that people want to define it, the things that are meaningful. And if you know, if we're looking at the conditions of food sovereignty, moving towards that could be an approach. But you don't have to label it as that if you don't want to. Yep. So I know different like from organization for sure yeah so uh, the Concordia food coalition was founded in 2013 to actually bid on the contract uh, so half of the group really wanted to like replace at the time it was Chartwells and the other half really wanted to like basically instigate more of a student-run kind of food organization or organizations here. Uh, people that challenged uh, the uh, multinational food service contract met a lot of barriers. Like I was saying, uh, people with legal kind of budgets could actually hire lawyers to read like these huge documents. Uh, actually, they met the requirements of like five million dollars more and five years experience. Uh, we actually had to kind of like play a game where we, we had to figure out how to like actually meet all of these requirements. And the way that we chose to do that is actually linking on with Coopsco. Coopsco actually has a backing. They've worked in food in uh, universities and SageUp settings. And uh, they were going to be a backing for us to bid on the contract. Uh, what happened though is they pulled it at the last minute. So they were really busy in their endeavors. And like two days before we were supposed to launch the bid, they decided not to do it. So that really uh, helped. It didn't, it didn't help in the process. But we made multiple kind of like bids for other groups. So we've been working with a group called Diversity Food Services in Winnipeg. Right now, actually, we're trying to think of how to replace now the multi national food service provider in 2026 is when the next contract expires. And we're actually building kind of the stepping stones to see if this is possible by linking on with organizations that have a track record, have you know more than uh, 3.5 to $5 million in sales, and uh, hopefully through a partnership with this organization that is more kind of community rooted, we might have a chance next time. But the other way is to convince Concordia not to go through the RFP, but basically to do this internally. So there's different mechanisms that this could be done. Uh, the People's Potato, the Hive Cafe, have actually made bids, or not made bids, but they've tried to make bids, and they've been refused. The, uh, Concordia will not allow them to do that because of these conditions that I'm saying. So it's been very difficult like to challenge the multinational food organizations. They basically have so much resources, they have so much capital that like it becomes very difficult. But now we're trying to lead this through like a coalition of the students, the food groups, and all of this stuff. And hopefully we have a better attempt next time. Yep. Sure, and this is, you know, I wish I had an easy response to this because we've had this problem here at Concordia as well. There are a lot of people that I, you know, thought would engage with some of the stuff that we're doing that haven't really done so. Uh, it's complicated because, look, I, I teach here at Concordia, and the regulations of the institution provided like very difficult ways to actually engage with people through like you know, action research in the classroom. For example, here's just an example. I have, uh, you know, uh, let's just say I have a class of 20 to 40 students, and it's 200 level. Concordia actually has expectations about grades. They think everybody falls into a bell curve, and actually only like 15% of your class should be in the A, or else you're doing something wrong. But I'm doing action research. I can bring everybody up to an A because we've benefited the community through the action that we've done and all of the work that we've actually meant to do it. Uh, but I might get in trouble for that. <laughs> so it's really strange. Like the kind of the institution regulations sometimes make it difficult for faculty to do so. I'll tell you also, uh, because of what I do in my classes, I have so much more homework also because I'm overseeing all these projects. And a lot of people don't want to actually take that on. So how do you convince faculty? Like, I think for a lot of people that are studying this stuff, it should be meaningful for them to be able to engage with it. Uh, but you know, you're basically telling them that they're gonna have trouble, especially when it comes to grading people and when it comes to extra labor. But you know, to me, these things are meaningful. So I you know, hope that anybody that actually wants to transform food systems or even like social politics will actually gravitate towards doing this. I wish I had a better response, though. If you could find out, tell me so that I could uh, get more faculty involved here. Yes? Can you comment on that? Like, what are the implications Maybe 
For sure. Yeah. Well, like I, I think there'll be a positive feedback loop almost. Is that if we could see the kind of fruition, or if we see the, you know, the positive uh, aspects of our of our teaching, then maybe they'll gravitate towards that more. Yes. I just would like to ask you to just repeat the bit of the question. Oh, sorry. Yes. And briefly. So yeah. People okay, so uh, the question was uh, maybe if faculty see kind of the fruits of their initiatives come to fruition, they might be more in engaged or more uh, willing to engage in this process, to which I was saying yes, for sure. <laughs> I guess the other question is how do we involve faculty, to which I don't have like a blueprint to do so. I try to by like talking with people and encouraging them to do so, and uh, that's as, as far as I've come with as well. So, yes. What was Brad that you applied for? Yeah, so we're saying it again. What was the grant that you applied for oh. for the decent urban park club for the front team for community for community and students, right? Yes. So uh, yeah, I guess the question for people online is uh, what grant did we apply for and actually we got uh, was actually from the sustainable action fund that will allow twenty students to come for free to uh, call of action and actually take part in the certificate for urban agriculture. Awesome. Anybody else? I don't see anybody. So look, I would like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, thank you for coming from McGill. Thank you for the Concordia students. Uh, thank you actually for everybody that has engaged in these projects. I know I see some familiar faces here, people that have actually done a lot of really cool work in the community and have actually been part of these food organizations. So pat on the back to all of you. Uh, thank you for coming on a Friday at 3 o'clock. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I yes. I have a quick question. Oh, sure. Uh, I was interested uh, to buy the basket. Yes. But from what I understood from the website, I had to go to Loyola every time to get it. Yes. Is it possible to get it delivered at this, on this downtown campus? At the present moment, we don't have too many resources to do so, but we're looking actually at how we can improve that, and hopefully that will be available at one point. It's not available right now until we figure out the logistics of that, though. So I guess the question, I don't know if you heard online, how do we, or do we provide baskets here at uh, downtown, and we don't do so right now through Call of Action, but hopefully in the future we will. Wonderful, and uh, yeah, so thank you all very much. Hopefully you uh, take this in and uh, we can actually implement some of these ideas. Hopefully we can actually start to think of campus food sovereignty instead of just weak notions of sustainability and actually make improvements that hopefully will be long lasting and have positive impacts on the communities that we reside in. So thank you all very much for coming and if you want to come talk to me, And feel free to stick around, get some food, have some drinks. It's Friday, yay! <laughs>